Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast, a place where we focus on the business side of art to help you attract more customers, increase profits, and ultimately live a life of creativity and financial freedom. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and this week's episode features Texas artist Brian Peterson. This is not your typical business talk, but rather a reminder to create the art that makes you happy. The art that invokes emotion within the artist and creates excitement within the process. We take it back to the basics of drawing slash painting because you love it rather than to make a dollar. If the product is great, the customers will buy it. But what your version of great compared to mine is vastly different. And that's just what makes us unique. You know, it depends on the subject, the color, the style, and the meaning. You know, what you like to create is not what I like to create. And that's the beauty of it. Your perfect customer is waiting for you to create the perfect thing for you because it will inevitably be the thing that speaks to them. So listen to this episode for a reminder to find out what art you are passionate about creating and then we'll worry about selling it. So let me know what you think about this week's very long episode with Brian Peterson. All right. I'm here with Brian Peterson and I want to deep dive into your art business because you look like you do something very different than me and that's always really intriguing to me. Tell me what kind of art do you do and how did you get to the space that you're in? Nice to be here with you Andrea. Yeah. I started doing this kind of style actually about oh my gosh is 38 years ago (laughs) something like that but I was doing it just on the side just messing around with it it's a woodcut look but it's really not a woodcut it's a it's a faux woodcut and I got the idea from a boss of mine who was a brilliant designer, McCray Magleby up at BYU in Utah. I was working for him, and he did a couple of posters using the style. I thought, wow, how did he do that? I didn't see any kind of linoleum cut or anything happening, and it was all done with pen and ink. I imitated that look for a couple of times and then decided, yeah, I think I could do this. This would be really fun. And then I began my career as a designer, graphic designer, and didn't do it again really that much until about three years ago when the pandemic hit. And then suddenly I was sitting around with not a lot to do in the design world. So I launched into this and really loved it. It was the best thing I ever found. I tell people it's maybe a form of meditation to do these drawings because it's just, they're detailed, but it's really fun to watch them develop and that kind of a thing. So it is a faux woodcut and it's done in pen and ink and done in negative. So what I'm really doing is producing a negative that I'm then going to flop in Photoshop with the invert button. And then I'll end up doing, have a, I'll have a reverse of that. And I can even show you, I actually brought a couple of things to show you if you want me to do that. Is that good? Yeah, for sure. I'm also, I pulled up your Instagram right here to look at. So anybody following along, look at his Instagram. Yeah, show me. Yeah, that's good. So you see, this is actually the drawing and it's done on tissue paper. And I don't know if you can see much detail there, but this is a cow. These are cows being sucked up into a a Texas tornado. (laughs) And down below you have a Dairy Queen because there are lots of Dairy Queens in Texas. And the idea for this came literally in the middle of the night. I'm just laying there, couldn't sleep, two in the morning. I'm thinking any good idea to me blends two things that aren't formally put together. So I thought we have Dairy Queen and we have tornadoes and we have cows. So in this case, it's three things. The tornado comes along, goes across the pasture, picks up the cows, and then they together head toward the Dairy Queen. So this drawing is called Texas Milkshake. And that's the basis for everything I do. It's not really very detailed or not an intelligent endeavor. It's more or less just having fun and messing around with stuff. So then I take that drawing and what I will do, and I don't really have a way of showing this necessarily, but I take this drawing and I reverse it out into a negative. And then I take that negative and now I'm in Photoshop and I actually draw on top of that negative with my pen tool, brush tool. Okay. And then I take that and import it into InDesign. And people say, are you crazy that you're using InDesign? But then what happens is I end up importing it into InDesign and creating color. So that's how it ends up looking. So it's just a fun deal with cows floating up and Dairy Queen and little fun little characters like these running people down here. This guy here is trying to escape. 
And so the whole thing is just really having fun with it. I like the idea that there are people hanging around the Dairy Queen that were unaware of the <laughs> impending danger. And then you have, of course, you have the floating cows that are all too aware. Yeah. But in the background, you have the cows that have passed right by that are just blissfully grazing in the field. And that's that concept. So I, I've done a bunch of these pieces recently that kind of took off and those were done with using aliens. The way that happened was I was just, I was doing a piece for the Kessler Theater in Bishop Arts area. I'm in Dallas, by the way. And the Kessler Theater is in Bishop Arts. And I was just doing the theater. And basically we had a, a sky and I decided let's put stars in the sky. And then oh, let's have a customer being sucked up into a spaceship. And I just did that as a whim. I have this guy flying through the air being sucked up into the spaceship. And people love that the best of anything. So they said, we like the guy being sucked up into the spaceship. So I ended up doing that. There's actually a cowboy here lassoing a flying saucer. And this became one of about 20 illustrations that I've done since then that, are, that I turned into prints. And it's all about aliens. In fact, I can turn this around. I'm doing one right now on my computer. This is the original drawing. These are aliens with horns, and they're flying toward a bunch of longhorn cattle. So this one is going to be called Herding Aliens. And it's basically aliens. And so what I did is I take this and I reverse it out. And that's what happens when you reverse it out. So all you're doing is using this little pen tool, but this little invert tool right here under adjustments, does everything for you. Hit that invert tool, and that reverses it out. See, so watch, I'll just do it. There you go. Okay, I gotcha. And when you invert it, it becomes a woodcut. And then what you do is you go high contrast on that, and then you take your little pen tool over here, and you just basically come in and draw. And I'm drawing right on, so you can see my arrow, make a little line over here. You can see right here, there's a black. And I'm just basically coming in and I'm messing with this drawing and drawing on top of it. Like these cattle need to have more shape and I'll just do it that way. So that's it. Nothing too terribly secret about it. But Very so cool. Okay, so you draw it and then you invert it to where your shading turns into the light areas. So the black becomes white. Yeah. So what my brain does is I think in, re in terms of reversing everything. So if somebody has white teeth, I'm going to make those teeth black. Okay. And yeah. then when you reverse it out, they're going to be white. If somebody has a, if there's anything about piano keys, if there are piano keys, the white keys become black and the black keys become white. And I draw it that way. And it's fun. It's a challenge because I'm always thinking, okay, how would it be? So when you shade something, Let's say you're trying to model a ball, and the ball, let's say, in the middle is highlighted. What does that highlight become? It becomes black. Yeah. And it goes out to white. You reverse it out, and all of a sudden, it's got a roundness to it, and you're doing it all with line work. I gotcha. So, okay. All right. Who are your buyers for these? It's interesting. There's a guy, Rick Rubin. Everybody knows who Rick Rubin is, the producer, famous producer out of L.A., I think. He once said that don't worry about selling your artwork. Just worry about having fun and doing it. If you have fun and if it's something that you really like, that comes through in the artwork and then people will seek you out. And so I do think you need to advertise like you need to put your artwork on Instagram. And I, I use Instagram and Facebook and a little bit of Pinterest. I think I get 45,000 views a month on Pinterest, which then takes them. Usually there are no sales because I don't sell on Pinterest. They might see me again on Instagram. So suddenly it, it takes about 10 times of seeing somebody's work over and over again so you post almost every day or every other day something and then what you do is people event generally start to see it on pinterest i have a link to my website and actually links aren't live on when uh, not pinterest on instagram they're not live so what you have to do is put out your actual website but on facebook there's a live link and it takes you right to my website which is by the way brian peterson art.com b-r-y a-N. Peter, from there, you can look at the selection, the catalog I've got of work, and you can pick. I, I picked four sizes that I like because I think, okay, not everybody has a big giant wall 
where they can put up a big poster. You look at some of the stuff I've got around the room here, and it's big stuff, but not a lot of people are going to be able to put that. Yeah. So what I do is I give them sizes that I think a 12 by 12, 20 by 20, 30 by 30, 40 by 40 that they can pick. And you and often it's, it's the 20 by 20 that's the most common size. And then pricing wise, that's really interesting. That's really hard to figure that one out. I started out thinking, oh, my work is really valuable. So I'm going to put it at these big high prices and then I got thinking, well, that's not going to sell. So then I lowered them and I thought, now, wait a minute, that's not worth it because the print is costing me 60 bucks, selling it for $80. The, the mailing is $20. <laughs> wait, I haven't made any money. So what the magic is, I take the price of these prints and I pretty much think if it's a print sell, if I buy a print for $60, because I'm not doing it here, although I can do prints, that Epson printer back there does. 17 by 22s, but I have an outfit here in town that does really beautiful work on coated, textured, it's got a tooth to it. I think it's 100% cotton rag paper. And I offer that as all, that's the only paper I want my prints printed on. And each print will be, let's say, $60 for a 20 by 20. Then I'll make it $120 and add the cost of mailing, which I add 20 bucks. So I'm selling a 2020. 20 by 20 for $140 with the idea that I'll make $60 on that print. I got you. Once I send it out. But I got to come back here and I've got to package it up and I've got to take it to UPS and do all that. So it's, I'm definitely earning that 60 bucks that I do. And then really, I love that Rick Rubin deal of if you love what you do, you'll do it well. If you do it well, people will notice it. People who notice it will eventually buy it. But if you go after the money, it's not going to work for you because the money, if you're just doing it for the money, it, it comes through in your work. People don't detect a love for the work. And like I was showing you earlier on this, like this picture of these aliens, the herd of cows, I just can't wait to get to the office to work on this print. It's, this is what I want to do. And I got thinking, well, if I don't ever sell it, I don't care. I'm just going to do it because I like to do it. I like that. Yes. I've had that a co with a couple of them. I'm like, if I don't ever sell it, I might just keep it. And those are always yeah. the best ones for sure. It's a great attitude to have because then you don't feel the pressure. Selling art isn't about pressure. Selling art is about receiving a reward on the back end of doing something you love to do. And if you do that, then the money comes automatically. It's really that way in anything you do. If you're a musician or whatever, and you're trying to figure out what the latest, greatest sound is, and you're going to produce it. It's not authentic because it isn't really what you would do if you had your own choice. It's anything is that same way. Being an artist of any kind or whatever it might be, you're going to have the same challenges. I love what you do. It's a great thing to do. I'm, you probably can't see it. It's a small studio, but I've got, my, I've got my keyboard here. You can see right there yeah. behind that print. I play music and I listen to podcasts and I just have a good time. I love that. You're such a true artist. You're like, I don't care about money. I just want to have fun. And I just, I find myself needing to think like that a little bit more sometimes because I'm so business minded. Yeah. But I, I will tell you this though, I've only been doing this for three years where I've been out to make money doing it. Before that, I was, I owned a design firm of eight people and I did that for 20 or well, 38 years. I did that first and I did love that too. I love doing design work and we worked for major corporations and did a lot of identities and we did a lot of branding and we did websites and everything else. And so I was the head creative in that company. I'm, I've never been a good man. I'm, in, I'm okay manager, but I don't do it to manage people. I do it because I like to do the artwork. And so I did that. It was called Peterson Ray and Company. In fact, you can look on our website. It's, it's peterson.com is the name of the website. You can see the work we've done for 38 years, and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. But I was really ready for a change, and I think I've hit the gold mine because I'm having a great time. And I produce about oh, maybe a print a week, maybe a design a week, or a one piece of art per week, maybe two. And I get commissions. I get a lot of commissions from people who want me to design maybe – something for a um, husband who passed away. I'm doing his portrait or, or I'm doing, I do pets sometimes. I do pets. But you do them all in your style, right? I do them all in my style because it's really what I like to do. That's, that's the way my brain thinks. 
what I'll do is I'll look at everything in terms of turning it into kind of a woodcut look. And, and I don't ever get tired of it. Like I can sit here and do this every day, all day, and not ever feel tired. In fact, I feel enthusiastic and it generates energy for me to do it. Very so. cool. I love that. Do you ever get asked to stray away from your style? The hard part about it is, I'll tell you, this is a good point, I think, because in the design firm, I had clients and they would come to me saying, we are going to be putting in this shopping mall. We are going to be doing this annual report for the corporation. And really the goal was to sell them and to do whatever was appropriate to their brand. So I would make sure everything I did was not about me, but was about them. And so I would, and that's the only way they would buy it anyway. If it was about me, they wouldn't want to buy it. Yeah. They want to buy something I'm selling for them. But in the art thing, what the where I turned the corner was, no, I don't really want to be told what to do. In fact, my deal is with portraits and commissioned work where I get paid up front. And I tell them that you're not going to have a chance to sign off on anything. You're not going to see anything until the finished thing is done. Because if you want what I do, I just have to do what I do. And I only had one time when somebody tried to get in the way of that and tried to say, can I see a rough? And I said, there is no rough. Because really, when I start drawing, it's going to be a drawing, pen and ink drawing. It's going to be this drawing. It's like, here's the drawing I just did for the one I'm working on right now. This is the drawing. And if I had to show that to somebody and said, this is what I want to do. You see how it's in reverse? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. True. Okay. And and they would say, are the cows going to look like cows? And, and then I'd have to say, that's where it'd be a problem because then you start feeling anxiety and you start feeling like, oh, now I'm having to bend my style to fit this project. So I get the money up front, 100%. I do the job. I present them with the job. And I don't make any changes to it. And that's totally different than where I was with the design firm, where in the design firm, they come in, we do a big meeting, talk about what we're going to do. I do some sketches and roughs and thumbnails. I might show them that or I might show them a comp I produce on my computer of the design. Then basically it's off to the races and you do the design. They approve it at several stages along the way. And when you get the final, it's approved. And then you've done exactly what they want you to do. In fact, I'm right now, I'm going to give you a little sneak preview. I'm actually, I got named as the, the, the official portrait artist for the Texas Songwriters Hall of Fame. These are songwriters that have been inducted into the Hall of Fame, and this is a big deal for them. So, for example, I don't know if anybody knows who Tanya Tucker is, but when I was working with them, I got thinking, oh, they're going to want me to do a certain style and it turns out that my client, Joe Abels, who owns a bar, the best bar in Austin, the Saxon Pub, said, I don't want to see anything. I don't want to see anything until it's done. I said, really? Okay. And that's when I got thinking, oh, I need to get out of that mode of showing them something. So I got thinking, I better show them a rough because this is a big official job. I've done it three years now. And every year I go back in and I'm, do you want to see anything? Nope. Just do it. And what's great about that is I end up doing just exactly what I want to do. So this is where I am on this one here. This is Eric Johnson, guitar player. And you can see that I do my design background to help me with doing the type. Yeah. In the background of these drawings, these are a little rough, cool. but I found little things about them in their life. I don't know why the foot, but there was some reason why the foot got in there. And then going over here, see if I can get, we see their hometowns often. And I just did these roughs. I don't have to show it to anybody. I just do it. And I'm doing six of those every year. And the first time anybody sees them really is when I bring them to the Hall of Fame. And they're 44 by 56 tall. And they're put next to the stage in a big row. And it's a cool deal. And I love it because I'm not really having to get anything approved. Does that sound weird to say that? No, no, really. So I'm in a, still in a stage where I don't really mind being told what to do and stuff. And But <laughs> I can definitely see myself being where you're at in however many yeah. years of just like, okay, nobody... Because it, it does get monotonous sometimes when customers just pick you apart. Like I just painted a green lime on a glass and can uh -huh. you make that more green? I was like, they're like it looks like a yellow yeah. green. Can you make it more green green? I'm like... Yeah, sure, whatever. Andrea, I'll tell you what, I'm 70 years old, so I've been around the block, and I did it that way. I started at my company when I was 31 years old, 
And I did 38 years of that. Let's tweak it. Let's fix it. Let's do this. Let's do it. And finally, this is a sign off and it's done. And I guess what happened to me is I did, just had done it enough that I thought, now, if I'm going to do this and enjoy doing it, I'm not going to be answering to anybody. I'm going to just do what I want to do. And what's happened because of that is I've ended up doing all these prints of even this Alien series that I've got that I don't do a thing except for do what I want to do. And people see it and, and then they just send me a note, how do I order one of these? And I just give them my website and say, here, you go on this website. And the order comes through on Squarespace. And boom, it says they want a 20 by 20 of this. I mean, it's, it's turning into where I'm even selling like six for an office complex, you know, the hallway. Or I, there's a brand new restaurant here in Dallas that bought three of them for their entryway. And so it's just fun how that works. And I feel really great about it. And I didn't have to get it approved by anybody. It might sound prima donna-ish, but I don't think it is because I think that it would be compromised. My work would be compromised if somebody said, could you move that cow over here? And could you have that one flying saucer, maybe not doing that and maybe move it over here? I think that would be a problem. I'll tell you uh, the greatest quote I've ever heard. And for problem solution, quote, and I use this in design because when a client would come in and say, my wife likes purple. And I think well, that's interesting. Why is your wife guiding this project suddenly? Or my husband likes purple, whatever it might be. So the quote is, give me a problem and I'll give you the solution. Give me the solution and I've got problems. <laughs> so, because your job as an artist is to come up with the solution. As soon as somebody who's not an artist is dictating what the solution is, you're no longer the artist. You are the hands this person's using to create their vision. So I stand by that. I think that even the design I did that, I said, I'm going to be real careful about not doing too much of what this person wants me to do. So what I would do is if I have to show ideas, I would show them maybe three ideas and put make one of those their idea, but then really sell the other two. Yeah and make sure they're better than their idea. And because let's be frank, art is not a group effort. Great art is, a, is if you're doing a, like what I'm doing, is a solo effort. You're not getting a board of directors to agree to your ability to do art. True. Yeah. You want to be the artist, yeah. not just the tool to make it happen. Oh, yeah. It's not fun to be the tool. Nobody wants to be a tool, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's how I believe, and I've, I've lived by that. And now in my years of doing this now, I, I stand by it wholeheartedly. That's what you got to do. I love that. But it takes a while to get there. It takes a while to get there. I hate to say it, but if you start off with an attitude, that is also a problem because I think a better solution would be to say, if somebody comes to you to do a project and they want to control you, you've got two choices. One is to make it so expensive they can't afford you, or... If they're going to control you, you're going to get paid really well to have you control. Yeah. <laughs> or you can say you just don't want to take the project because you don't have time to do it. But I would, if you are doing something super fast and being controlled by somebody else as to what the art is, and they're not paying you much, you're not making a living. You're not doing, you're not an artist. You're basically a a tool, like you said, to get that done. So true. Yeah. Okay. What is your process? Like you said that you get an order in for a 20 by 20. Well, and really what it is, I don't, for, I would say 70% of my work, I don't get any orders in at all. Okay. I do the work on okay. that. Maybe 80%. And that, and the fun thing about that is that I'm basically deciding, getting up in the morning and saying, what do I want <laughs> to do? I love coming to the studio, sitting down and saying, Okay, what do I want to do? And I will tell you, and we should probably talk about this, there is a creative process because where do these ideas come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that because I have a couple just spinning in my head. I need to make time for this. I want to do this and go in between two different ideas right now. But I'm like, they're two very different. Try to decide which one to do. Where does it come from for you? For me, it comes from living life and inputting into your internal computer your everyday life, and that is not sitting in front of a television set. Although there's nothing wrong with watching them. I love series on TV like anybody else does. You can gain some things from seeing TV, but I like to look at, first of all, there are no new ideas. So what I do is I look at art 
And I say, how would I do that? What is my spin on that project? Rick Rubin, once again, if you read anything about Rick Rubin, you'll say, there's not an original idea on the face of the earth. All you're doing is taking an existing idea, processing it out of your own internal computer, and then projecting it in the way you see it. What makes it cool and unique is that it's your own because it's projected with your vision. That's what makes it cool and unique. So the best way to do art is just to start doing art. Just start doing it. Don't think about it too much. Get the nucleus of an idea. I'll tell you what, literally I do, I go to sleep okay at night, but it takes me about an hour to go to sleep. And I'll lay there in bed and I'll think, oh, okay, this alien thing is fun. What else can I do? Let's have, how about an alien doing this and cows or a cowboy? And I'll just create these ideas in my mind. What would happen if there's this great national park in Texas that's made up of these Cadillacs that have been put into the ground in a row? And it's called the Cadillac Ranch. Okay. So let's have these aliens messing with the Cadillac Ranch. And instead of lifting a cow up to the spaceship, they're going to pull one of these Cadillacs out of the spaceship. And so I'll have the line of, ca- of Cadillacs, one of the Cadillacs floating up with the aliens above pulling it up. Another one is I have is, I call it cow jacked. And what it is, where you see the, I've always wondered what happens when the cow gets up into the spaceship? And is that a good situation? You're pulling the cow into the spaceship, it gets there. Okay, now the cow is inside the spaceship and the aliens are there. What does the cow do? I think the cow goes ape. It goes, starts running around the spaceship and probably destroys stuff. And so I got thinking, okay, let's frame this in Palo Duro Canyon. I like Texas landmarks. Palo Duro Canyon. And let's have these three aliens ejected from the spaceship and the cow behind the wheel flying the spaceship away. Now it's called a cardiac. And those ideas, it's funny because if somebody were sitting there with me and that, I said, I'm going to do one where the cow carjacks, cow jacks the spaceship, they might be like, well, that's a stupid idea. But what I do is I don't let that discourage me or get in the way. I don't even, I don't, I don't even tell anybody about it. I just do it. I say, okay, let's just get this happening. Let's do it. I just let ideas kind of come and then I don't overthink them. Because art is not about thinking. Art is about creating emotion and feeling. So you don't need a really amazing idea. Look at the Mona Lisa. What is the idea behind the Mona Lisa? It's not really an idea. Is this a person? Is that person smiling? Or does that person have a straight face? What is it? It could be either. And that's what makes that's what makes that so wonderful. And I don't think that it was a Leonardo da Vinci that did that one. I don't think he sat and thought for days about what expression to put on that person's face. I think he just did it. So I think that's what we do. I think we just do it. So here's that illustration right there. This is reverse. Okay, so you can see the three aliens down on the ground and the cow behind the wheel of the spaceship. And that background is Palo Duro Canyon. And that is the idea start to finish and that's all it is. I like the irony that you have with that. It makes you think. You're like, wait, something's different. The best ideas are usually a little bit of a twist because when you happen to watch a TV show, if you know what's going to happen in the end, it's not fun. But when it gets to the end and you go, oh, I didn't see that coming. Wow, that's a good show. I like that show. So what I like to do is I like everything to come out of one little nucleus of an idea, just a little nugget of an idea. And you take that idea and you say, what if this was happening? And then you expand it into your own kind of vision. My vision is that spaceship, those aliens, that canyon, and that picture. And that's my vision. And I don't think anybody else would think of doing it this way. In fact, I know they wouldn't. And I also think that in art, it's important to find your own style that you can own. And what I mean by that is if you, I think it's okay to imitate people for a while. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. Imitate, like I did with my boss. I saw what he did with this this faux woodcut look, and I thought, that's pretty cool. I would like to do the same thing. And then what happened is that I took it and made it my own. I said, but if I did it, I would do it this way. 
So you really want to ultimately create a style that when somebody sees it, they say, oh, that's that guy. And I think I've successfully done that with this art that I don't see anything on Instagram or Facebook that looks that similar. What's funny about it is I actually saw, I started doing these spaceship things with the cows. And that might have been my own ego saying, oh, I think I've invented something here. Because I started seeing other spaceships pulling up cows. In reality, that could happen way before my, my art. But it doesn't really matter. In fact, I always say, if somebody says, well, you're telling people how you do this. What if they rip off your style? I, I tell them, if they can do it better than me, they should do it. Yeah. That's why I look at it. If they do it, maybe they'll do it different than me. And maybe that'll be just as valid as what I'm doing. None of us own anything. We're just borrowing it. Borrow your method, borrow your style, borrow your tools, create something that feels good to you, that you like, that when somebody looks at it and says, I like Andrea, because she does this artwork and I associate it with her, then I think you're on to something at that point. Yeah. For sure. You make me want to find my own style even more. I have a little bit of an idea, but... Yeah, it's, it's a hard one because uh, finding your style is maybe the wrong wrong motivation. Maybe what it ought to be is just do what you like and let it develop on its own. I want to paint with glitter. That's what I like. Yeah, man, I'll tell you what, man, there you go. That's exactly what I'm talking about is where you just find, yeah, why not? You'll... If you want to do it, if I were to, if you were to say to me, Brian, I want you to start painting with glitter, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't come to work, <laughs> you know, because I would feel like, oh, I don't want to work with glitter. But you liking that and wanting to do—that's all it takes, because you're going to do it better than me by far, because you want to do it. You're so right. How could you lead someone through this? I was thinking about how I could really find out what I want to paint, and I was thinking like, okay, if I close my eyes, and what pigments would I want? to use and it's like hot pink <laughs> and like really yeah. just bright I love bright colors and or maybe what a pretty image would look like in my head I'm trying to go through my head of like, what do I really like what would I be excited right. to paint I think that in the end Rick Rubin once again I'm going to be selling him <laughs> up the trees but that's what he says but he says just start doing yeah. it because if you think about it you'll talk yourself out of it yeah even in owning my design firm all those years, I was 31. I told my dad I was going to start my own design firm. And he said, oh, bad idea. <laughs> you need health insurance. You have two kids, wife and two kids. This is not going to be good for your family. You're going to. And I thought, yeah, if I start thinking about this, I could talk myself out of it. But I was so naive that I just did it. So I think there's a certain benefit to being naive and to not even knowing what it's going to take and just do it. If you get out the brushes, get out the paints, get out the other, whatever you want to do, get out the computer, or the pen and ink, the pencil, whatever it might be, and just start doing it and see what comes out of it. Because, you know, what I was doing initially, if you look at my Instagram, which I think is Brian Peterson Art is my name on my Instagram. If you look at that, go way down to the bottom where I started three years ago, it doesn't look anything like what I'm doing now. I Me mean, looks a little bit like what I'm doing now. It's still the woodcut look, but it's a lot more serious. And I was doing blues artists and I, I've always liked doing musicians. So I was drawing musicians, but I don't do that as much anymore now because I worked through all that. And now I want to do something that's a little more fun and different and actually has an idea to it rather than just a kind of a portrait that shows B.B. King a certain way. I want to actually talk about B.B. King or have some idea about B.B. King in the, in the piece. So I'm trying now to work ideas into everything I do. What is my idea? I think that's what really sticks with people anyway. They love ideas. They want to see, what were you thinking when you did this? And I think what makes people really interested in art is you're going, that's bizarre. Why would you ever want to do, in my case, aliens and cows and cowboys I don't know. I, I think where they got started was Texas. I just started thinking, well, Texas, everybody thinks Texas is full of cowboys. Of course, it's not. But I thought, let's put cowboys in Texas. And let's. And then, of course, there's the Marfa lights. And there's the idea of, of aliens in Texas and New Mexico. So let's just pull aliens into the picture. And that's how the idea was born, really. Very cool. You have so, me thinking about now yeah. the idea behind things, too. Not only what pigments do I want to use, what do I want to say? with it or yeah oh there you go i mean what you just said is really the key what do i want to say and i think what you can say is you can say i just want to give joy 
I just want somebody to laugh when they see this. That's good enough. Isn't art really about emotion? It's about evoking emotion. The best songs are the ones where you get a feeling. You're listening to the song and you're thinking, oh, I get a feeling from that. And I think the same good thing goes for art. You say, what feeling does this evoke? So in my case right now, I'm working on the idea of evoking humor and joy. And we need joy in the world, right? We have enough other stuff. We need a lot of joy. We need artists. We need artists that are creating joy and creating positive images. And you can still be an artist that does negative images, too. I'm planning to do that. But it's whatever you want to do. It's just up to you to make it happen. So true. Okay. All right. I'm just going to go run to my studio after this and just throw something on that I want. Just to throw (laughs) glitter everywhere. Yeah, just have fun with it. That's what will happen. By the way, if anybody out there is interested in talking about art or asking a question about art or sharing a thought maybe with me about art, about how they feel about it. You can always go to my Instagram, which is B-R-Y-A-N Peterson is my Instagram. So I know you have a question down here about future goals and plans. And really, it's funny. I don't really believe in a whole lot of planning. I'm a planner. My wife will tell you that I'm the ultimate planner. I'm also focused. But really what I do is I kind of plan short term. I just plan out what I'm going to do that day. I happen to know that I've got a design. It's a songwriters contest that's due on Friday. And I know that today's Tuesday. So I probably had to get going on that tomorrow. So I'll come into work focused and ready to work on that. But that's about the extent of the planning. As far as my art goes, I don't know where I'll be in a year, hopefully somewhere totally different than I'm really having a great time with. I think you can get mired in plans. I think if you think too much about, I've got to plan everything out, It takes away the spontaneity. It takes away something that could happen accidentally. And that's another, by the way, a good thing to know is that I think a lot of the best stuff that we do is totally by accident and not planned out. Yeah, just by experimenting. I just started this other series. I wanted to do a floating island series with little castles or whatnot on it. And I did the first one and I didn't love it as much as I thought I was going to. And I... I actually planned it a little too far out. I had done the backgrounds of a couple others. And now I'm looking at it after doing the first one. And I'm like, I don't even know if I want to keep doing with this. I have this other idea. So I had over planned and planned the backgrounds of several ones where now I'm like, I did the one and it's not as cool as I thought. So yeah, that, that, that's just an example of just being in the moment. Hey, you know what though, Andrea, I'll tell you something else that, that happens to me on these illustrations. It's like this. You start off with really a lot of excitement about it. (laughs) You start to generate the art. There is a crisis, what I'll call it, where you're thinking, oh, this doesn't look good. It's not what I wanted it to be. And usually with me, it happens in the coloring stage. Like I'll do the art, black and white art, this woodcut style, and I'll get to put my color into it. And I can't get the color to work. And then so I'll, and there's the, my latest illustration I did is called Marfa Lights. I don't know if I have it anywhere here, but it's called Marfa Lights, and it's about Marfa, Texas, and the lights, mysterious lights that are on the horizon that nobody knows where they come from. And there's a lot of lore about them being Indian spirits and energy generated by who knows what, but nobody's really figured out where they came from. So I did this. And ultimately, what happened is that I got into the coloring stage, and I just about threw it away. I came real close to to ditching it. And then all of a sudden, I just took out all the color, made it more monochromatic, and brought in some colors that made no sense. And that was it. That was the final answer. That's like this. It's like you start off, you get excited about it. Suddenly, you have this crisis. You think it's not going to work. And you can ditch it. I've done that. Or you can push through and just wipe the slate clean and do something with that drawing or whatever color wise and that makes it all of a sudden work and then it takes off and then suddenly it's what you wanted it to be but it's almost like you have to have that crisis to get to that oh, point yeah. nothing is ever easy i don't think it's any there's nothing about being easy it's just you have to endure and be determined is a good word that's a good point. Yeah. Cause I through, through the middle of it, I was like, yeah. this is taking way longer than I wanted to take. And then when it was finally done, I was like, look what I did. <laughs> so it's like, you get that excitement. And it's like, yeah. And there's like, okay, now we're back. It's like a painting roller coaster. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. No, it, roller coaster is a good uh, metaphor because it, 
you are like up and down all the way through the process. And sometimes you end up with something you're not really that. And I can look back on my Instagram feed and see illustrations that I cringe at. That doesn't work that well. But I don't really worry about that because it doesn't really matter. I don't think art is good or bad. I think art is whatever you create. And I think that you should never take somebody else's judgment as being the final answer mm -hmm. on your art. I think it should come from you. And I don't think anybody has the right to say this is bad art. I think that if you think it's bad art, it's bad art only because you think it. But I think that the best art, look at Van Gogh, I think, did not sell a painting while he was alive. I think his brother ended up selling all of his artwork, but Van Gogh thought he was a miserable failure. And then what happened is that he died. <laughs> and suddenly people started saying, wow, this worked. And then pretty soon they just started going nuts. You know, hey, I, I just realized I've got that Marfa Lights on the wall here. I'll show it to you. So this, it's framed. I didn't realize I had this. So this is the Marfa Lights. I don't know if it's got a reflection in it, but you can see how it looks. Oops. So it's going the wrong way, but you can see what, what it looks like. Yeah, no, anyway. I love that. So it's yeah. mon very monochromatic. And that was the answer. So don't let anybody discourage you from your art. And you know what? I don't even know that it's a good idea to be asking a lot of opinions. I don't think it's a good idea. I think artists are very fragile. I think we're a very fragile lot. And I think we are purposely because we're trying to be in tune with a higher level of creativity. Therefore, it makes you sensitive and it makes you fragile. And all it takes is for you to do a piece of art and somebody who fancies himself a critic to say, well, that's crap, for you to, to lose all of your momentum and say, I'm not good. Come to the conclusion, I'm, I guess I'm just not good. And I think that's a sad thing because that person doesn't know anything more than you do about art, your art. You're the only person that knows about your art, what you do. I don't know. It's a hard thing because I know shows get juried. People put in art and shows and they get juried in or out. Somebody's judging it. Yes, I like this. I deal with a print company that they basically sell my prints and they can say, we don't like this one. We like this one. But I say to myself, that's great. It's good that you like yeah. anything. But that doesn't mean that one they don't like isn't good. It just means for their purposes, the one they do is going to do better and sell better. And so that's their right, 100% to say that. It should never discourage me from doing art or doing that style of art. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it definitely does. I'm really just over here pondering everything and just applying it to my own life selfishly. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I have a lot to say. I'm still trying to figure it out. I know that this is all experimental on my part. I don't really even know what I'm doing and where I'm going. Somebody said, how'd you come up with this? I said, I don't really even know what I'm doing, honestly. I'm just having fun. I'm saying, I guess it should come out of me because I'm the only me in the world that I'm aware of, unless I've got a doppelganger somewhere. I, don't, I haven't run into him yet, but I'm the only me. I'm the only person qualified to do this kind of art because I'm the only me. I'm just going to do the best I can do with what I have to work with. And that's going to be good enough. That's so right. Okay. I'm going to do this series that I have in my head. I'm going to do it because I'm the only me who can do it. <laughs> Good. I'm helping you make some de determinations. You are the only. That's a wonderful thing when you think about it, how unique everybody is. And it's like there's not two alike. So it's, there's no contest here. There's no contest of who's better or who's more qualified or whatever. The Hall of Fame chose me to do these portraits because their Hall of Fame portrait artist <laughs> died. That's what happened. So they were looking around and they went on Instagram and they saw me doing musicians. And they said, do you do musicians? They called me up and said, this other portrait artist did oil paintings. And they said, can you be our new portrait artist? And I said, wow, what a fantastic opportunity. They said, can you do oil paintings? I have no clue how to do an oil painting. And I said, no, I can't do oil paintings, but I can do what I do. And luckily they said, oh, okay, well, all right, then do what you do. But see, in their mind, they were thinking portraits are mm -hmm. oil paintings. You need to do oil paintings. But luckily I didn't have to do that. Yeah, look, you're just doing you. Yeah. So last question as we wrap it up, what's your last piece of advice? Something that you would give someone who wants to do what you're doing, but they're in the very starting position. They're like, they have a job. They're like, I want to be able to do this. I want to paint what I want to paint. How can I do this? What's your best piece of advice? 
when you say they have a job, they have a position or they have a job doing something else in my computer. Yeah, okay. a job they don't like. Yeah. So now you have an art, you do, you're in a job, you don't have an art job. You have a job where you're fine. You're a secretary or administrator for, for some corporation, but you really want to be an artist. I would say there's no better time to start than right now. Don't let thinking about it get in the way of doing it. I think that, and by the way, I heard one time that the best writers write 1,500 words a day. The best golfers hit 1,000 balls a day. What do those two have in common? Because golfers have nothing to do with writers. What they have in common? Mm -hmm. They do a lot of it. They want to do it and they do it. If you're going to be a great golfer, you don't think about doing, about going to the range and hitting 1,000 balls. You just go to the range and you maybe start with 100 balls and then you go home. And then eventually when you become a pro and you have all that time in your hands to do nothing but golf, now you're trying to hit those flag sticks and you're trying to do a thousand. And the same thing goes for the writer. A writer writes 1,500 words a day. Maybe they don't go to bed until they write those words and they force themselves to write those words. And then out of that forcing themselves to write the words becomes brilliance. Because what happens is you can't write 1,500 words and not have 10 of them means something more than the other 1,490. And those 10 words are like, oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. And then what happens is as you do it more, you maybe get 200 words. I think as you do drawings and you do a drawing, I tell my grandchildren, you want to be an artist, start drawing and don't erase anything. I had a grandchild who was drawing and erasing. Well, you're erasing it. It wasn't good. You know what? Don't erase anything. Get a new piece of paper, draw something else, and then get a new piece of paper. Don't go backwards on anything. Just go forward on everything. So my advice to anybody getting into art that maybe is doing something they don't want to do right now in something else is just to spend, let's say, an hour a day and say, I'm going to from 7 to 8 o'clock every night, and I'm going to watch my Netflix after that, or I'm going to go for a walk before that, but... For that one hour, I'm going to sit in front of a blank pad of paper with a pen, and I'm going to start just drawing anything, just draw anything. And I'm going to maybe draw this, I'm going to draw this can of pens. I did this drawing, this is one I did in Hawaii recently, and it's, I only have my tissue paper there, but this basket was just sitting there, and I thought, okay, I'm going to draw that basket and that umbrella and that bush, and I just started drawing. If I would have thought about, if I'd have walked around forever thinking, what am I going to draw? I don't want to draw. That's not going to look good. Or I would never draw anything. I'd be going home with nothing. But instead, what you do is, right now, Andrew, where you're sitting right now, if you look just where you're sitting right now, just train your eyes off the screen and look at something else that's not on your computer screen. And just look, I'm going to look at this lamp right here. And you start looking at that lamp, you start saying, you know what? It's got really cool things happening. It's got great reflections. It's got a cool structure. I can see this shape. I can see the cord winding around the top of it. This is the lamp I'm looking at right here. I'm looking at that lamp. And I'm going to say, I can see all these things. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a piece of paper and I'm going to put it in front of me and I'm going to start drawing that lamp. I'm going to draw that cord. I'm going to draw that... And then I'm just going to draw that lamp. And that's all I'm going to do. It's not going to be in hanging in a museum, and it's not going to be anything I'm going to show to anybody necessarily. It's going to draw that lamp. And then what happens is you find yourself looking, and when you start studying life around us, you realize that everything around you is full of information. And if you start looking carefully enough at it, you're going to realize that, wow, that is the coolest thing ever. That coffee cup is a pretty cool thing. That, whatever it might be, box of Kleenex, the way the Kleenex kind of, or the tissue rolls around, that's a pretty cool thing. And then what you start realizing is that you were surrounded by cool stuff. Now, take the hand, put the pen in the hand, put it on the paper, and start drawing. And if you do that, you might, don't make it accurate. doesn't matter what you do. Don't even judge it. No judging going on here. Draw it. Just start drawing yeah, get good at your craft. And then just call it that. You're done. And what is good? Good at your craft. What does that mean? 
your version of good to where you're happy. With. Exactly. When you start saying, oh, you know what? That exceeds my expectation. That's better than I thought it was going to be. The coolest thing about the style I've got is when I've done that art and I have no idea how it's going to look. But you see here, you got the chest of the cow is white. The reflection is white. The alien head is black. The sky is white. The ground, it looks like this. And then what you do is you say, now I'm going to go up here and I'm going to grab ad adjustments and I'm going to invert it. And it's, that is the moment that is just total euphoria for me. Because I look at that and go, that's way better than I thought it was going to work. <laughs> In fact, what I'll do now is I'll often go back and look at my drawings. And I'll look at the final piece that I've come up with. And I thought, that, that drawing doesn't look anything like the final piece. It got so much better after I reversed it out and started drawing on top of it. And then you start thinking, I'm excited about this. And that's how it is. There you go. I think I've given you all I've, I've got. So Yep, we've gotten an hour, which is more than most people talk. But I love it. You're going to want to edit this way down, you know. I love it, though. No, this is great. We've had several comments on here I just want to share with you. So we commented saying, yes, this is so inspiring. Makes me feel so good to hear that. Yeah, good. And then they're all commenting, thank you, thank you. I said, and then Stefan commented, he agreed with you. Yep, don't let thinking about doing it get in the way of doing it. Yeah, so everybody's just echoing what you're saying. And we appreciate you taking a whole hour out yes. of your time to to, <laughs> to talk to us. You bet. Oh, no, I had a good time. I had a really good time. It's funny because when you do these kind of things, it makes you, it sharpens the tool, it makes you think, yeah, I could probably be doing this a lot more on my own. But I'll tell you what, if you love doing it, I have played the piano and I played the piano in bands and I played piano since I was 10 years old. So I played the piano for 60 years because I'm old as dirt. But when I was raising my kids, I wanted them all to be piano players. And right now I've got one out of four that's a piano player. And what is the difference between that kid and the other three? And they all, by the way, the other three have all found other things that they like doing. And the one that plays piano just does it for fun, but she's really good at it. But the difference was, is when she would walk by the piano, she had to stop and play something, just standing in front of it, just play something, and then walk on. It was like five notes, and then walk on. And I got thinking, you know, that's what makes us a good artist, is that, do what you would do for fun. Do what you would do if nobody cared. And don't try to meet anybody else's expectation. Don't try to become anything. Don't try to be famous. Don't try to make a lot of money. Don't try to, don't try to do any of that. But do your art and show your art. Do your art, show it. And the reason why I say show it, nothing sadder than an artist who doesn't show their art. Show your art. That's when people come back to you and say, Andrea, God, I saw that piece. Cool. And what does that do to you? Oh, it's maybe cooler than I thought <laughs> yeah. it was supposed to be. So I'm going to keep going. And one of my mentors, who if you want everyone to see a great Texas artist, John Fleming, johnfleming.com, F-L-A-M-I-N-G, said to me when I first started doing this art, he said, Brian, two words. Keep going. Just keep going. That's my advice. Yeah. Just keep going. Don't stop. Keep going. Don't stop. Okay. I gotcha. <laughs> yeah, just keep going. Yeah. Just keep doing it. This was great. I loved it. Thank you. Any questions, send me a note on Instagram. I'll be happy to answer or talk to you, whatever you want to do. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Artist Academy podcast. I've been putting out at least one episode per week for more than four years on this podcast. And it's really cool to see those download numbers go up and up as time goes on. And that's because artists like you listen and share these episodes. So really, when I say thank you, I mean it. <laughs> it's really cool to see progress along the way. And anyway, if you like this type of art and business content, then I highly encourage you to get the audio version of my book, Mural Money, with over 15 hours of listening inspiration. I'm currently running a special of just $17 for the audio version. You can go to muralmoney.com to find it. And that comes with a bunch of extras like my art supply list, my pricing guide, recommended book and podcast list, and so much 
much more. I filled that book with tips from my art journey of building a profitable mural career. Plus, I've included the best of the best advice from guests I've interviewed on this podcast. It's the most affordable all-in-one book of advice on art and business that I have. And if you enjoy listening to me here, then I know you'll like the book too because I read it myself all 15 hours of it. (laughs) The book is available on Amazon and Audible normally for $25, but if you go to muralmoney.com, that is where you can grab the special $17 deal while it lasts. If you haven't listened to my book yet, this is your sign to do it. Again, normally $25, running a special for $17, but you have to go to muralmoney.com. That's where you can grab the audio version of it. And that's all I have for you today. So I will see you next week for another episode of the Artist Academy podcast.